I'll admit I have a complicated relationship with SETI. SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And, and I totally get the, the motivating question that drives it's these searches for life outside the Earth, and especially intelligent life outside the Earth, which is, are we alone? We have been asking this question since basically forever, and especially once we realize that those tiny little dots of light in the sky are indeed other stars, and those stars are likely to have other planets, and those planets are likely to have life. Is any of that life intelligent? But the big question here, like, like the big paradox here, something called Fermi's Paradox, attributed to Enrico Fermi, a famous 20th century physicist, which was, okay, okay, we're here, obviously, we're alive, obviously, we're intelligent, debatable, but let's take it for granted. There should be absolutely nothing special about this setup. There's, there's no privileged positions in the universe. There's no privileged places or scenarios. If life happened here, then it must happen elsewhere because nature doesn't do one-offs. Nature doesn't do one-of-a-kinds. If, if it can do it once, it can do it many times. So the universe should be flooded with life. It should be flooded with intelligent life. There should be multiple intelligent civilizations throughout our galaxy, and our galaxy is billions of years old, and so that's plenty of time for any intelligent creatures to flood the Milky Way, and so uh, they should be here. But they're not. Hence the paradox. This is the big question. And so uh, the only way to resolve this question of are we alone or not is through looking for it, is through examination through through study, through observation. So that's why SETI exists. That's why there is intentional searches for extraterrestrial intelligence. And the fundamental assumption of SETI is that an intelligent civilization will be easier to spot than a uh, non-intelligent life. Like, yeah, there, there might be a planet full of bacteria, but they're not exactly announcing or broadcasting their presence, so they're going to be hard to spot. Uh, but, but a planet full of creatures who have, say, radios and radio antennas, they are broadcasting, literally broadcasting their presence, and so they'll be easier to find. So so even though presumably intelligent life is rarer than non-intelligent life, they are louder and they can do more things and they can manipulate their environment and so they can make themselves known more easily than non-intelligent life. Now this, this is the fundamental assumption of SETI. It is an assumption. We have no idea how common life is. We have no idea how common intelligent life is. We have no idea how detectable intelligent life is. But it, you got to start somewhere. And so that's where SETI starts off, is looking for what we call techno signatures. These are signs of not just intelligent creatures, but technologically advanced creatures. And by technologically advanced, we mean at least of the technological level of us. So for example, once we invent the radio, like we did in the middle 20th century, we assume that intelligent creatures around the universe will figure out essentially the basic same principles and also develop the radio. So if we're broadcasting radio emissions from the Earth, and they're just expanding out into space, then aliens who, who live right now or who lived long ago would have done the same thing. So maybe we can listen for their radio signals. This has been the primary goal of most SETI initiatives. Because why? Because we've got a lot of radio telescopes anyway with some spare time, and it's easy to just scan and listen rather than developing some sort of more active probe. And so scanning for radio emission from aliens has always been the biggest uh, part of SETI. But the scanning for radio, this part isn't in the SETI brochure all that much. It depends on aliens directly beaming a strong signal at us. Why? Because the if you're not directing, if you're not focusing a radio emission on a target, then it just spreads all over the place and it gets weaker and weaker and weaker. If you were an alien, to give you an example, if you were an alien listening for the Earth's 
radio emissions, and just our background, just our TV, our air traffic control, our radio, and all that. If you were listening for it, if you were anywhere past our nearest neighbor star, then our radio emissions are just sunk into the background noise, radio noise of the galaxy, because all sorts of stuff in our galaxy also emits in radio. And so as soon as you get to too far out, our emission, our artificial emission, sinks down so low, it's so weak that it gets mixed up with just the generic natural radio emissions of our galaxy. So if you're anywhere past her nearest neighbor, you don't know that we're here. And with our current technology of radio telescopes, we've been listening for directed blasts, like someone knows we're here and sends us a massive signal. Maybe we could catch it then. Uh, that seems a little like a little bit of hubris to me, but what are you gonna do? In the future, we are going to have more sensitive radio telescopes that could pick out the general undirected radio emission. But again, the challenge here is hoping, crossing your fingers, that an artificial signal once it's buried down in the background noise of all the radio static in the galaxy, that you'll still be able to pick it out of that noise, that you'll be able to find that needle in the haystack. That is not an easy thing to do. It's not guaranteed to work, especially because you don't know exactly what form the artificial signal is going to come in. Yet you just hope that if you build a big enough and sensitive of enough radio telescope that you can just scan and listen, and you'll get all the radio emission from the galaxy and the wider universe, and that somewhere in there, there might be hints of an artificial signal. Okay, but so far, we haven't heard anything. There have been zero results from SETI. Nothing. So where is everybody? And we've looked for other techno signatures too. So, so radio isn't the only thing. So maybe aliens already visited the solar system and left an artifact. We, we see no artifacts, you know, there's no monoliths that buried in the, in the lunar surface. Uh, maybe uh, super advanced aliens could enclose their star in a bunch of solar panels, like a Dyson swarm kind of deal, and it would block the light from the star. And from our perspective, that would change the spectrum of the light. We wouldn't see the star itself. We would see the waste heat from all the structures around it. We don't see anything. Maybe aliens could like mess with the chemistry of their star to let other people know they're there. No, there's nothing. Mess with pulsar, nothing. All the techno signatures that we've come up with, all the ways that aliens could potentially announce their presence, we have not been able to spot. So maybe, maybe SETI isn't a good idea. You know, there are arguments against SETI the primary argument is that it's difficult to uh, uh, verify or validate its, its falsifiability because you assume, in order for SETI to work, you have to assume that there is intelligent life out there. Well, how many results, how many scans, how many surveys with zero results does it take before you decide that there are indeed no intelligent civilizations out there, at least detectable intelligent civilizations. We've already done like around a hundred spanning over half a century and haven't had anything. So do we do another 10 years, another hundred years? At what point do we give up? There's no clear answer for that. So maybe we shouldn't look for intelligent life because we don't know how common or rare it is. We don't know how detectable intelligent life is. But non-intelligent life, even though it's not broadcasting its presence, makes itself detectable. Check this out. Check this out. There's this big debate in the SETI community about active SETI. Should we broadcast ourselves? Should, should we announce our presence to the outside galaxy? Should we find a promising star system and blast a hello to that star system? Say, hey, we're humans. We're here. Nice to meet you. There's debate because people are worried that maybe aliens will come and like destroy us. I, it's ridiculous. All right, one, it's mostly ridiculous because if aliens have the technology to cross interstellar distances, then they already know we're here. And it's ridiculous because we've already announced our presence. It's too late. But we didn't do it. We didn't do it. Our single-celled ancestors did it. You see, life is really, really good at throwing planets out of equilibrium. When it comes to the Earth, 
there was uh, ox oxygen. We were born with a certain amount of oxygen, but oxygen is super reactive, volatile, floats away, does its own thing, doesn't listen, and very, very quickly, the Earth lost all of its oxygen in the atmosphere. But then about two billion years ago, photosynthetic creatures were eating carbon dioxide and burping out oxygen, reached a critical threshold which completely swamped our atmosphere with oxygen, led to a huge extinction event. It was a very complicated time for life. But it boosted the amount of oxygen in our atmosphere from photosynthesis, and it's maintained those high levels ever since. That is not a natural system for a planet like Earth. Its equilibrium state is to not have a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere, but life changes that equilibrium. Non-intelligent life is perfectly capable of broadcasting or announcing its presence. You just have to know how to look. And how do you look? You look with a telescope. That's how you look, just like everything else in astronomy. Check when, when you have a star, and a planet crosses in front of the face of the star, the brightness from that star relative to us dims a little bit because that planet is blocking a little bit of a light, and, and we can detect the planet. This is called the transit method. We've used this to discover thousands of exoplanets, and we can use it to study the atmospheres of exoplanets because when that planet crosses in front of the star, some of that starlight passes through the planet's atmosphere and on into our telescopes. And then whatever's in that atmosphere will absorb or emit certain wavelengths. It will affect the spectrum of the light filtering through that atmosphere. So by studying the spectrum, we can figure out the chemical composition of that atmosphere and we can determine if it is out of equilibrium or not. Maybe there's a lot of oxygen or methane or other things that life does that natural processes, non-life processes don't do. We already have this technology, but it's limited to big hot planets around giant stars uh, or bright stars that are easy to see so we can get a clear signal. But this is gonna change. It's gonna change with the James Webb Space Telescope. Right now, TESS, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, is building up a list of candidates promising potentially habitable worlds and then James Webb is going to follow up on those worlds and study those atmospheres and look for signs of life, look for signs of disequilibrium. And then we don't even have to go that far to potentially hunt for life. There might be life in our own backyard. We used to think Earth was the only place in our solar system with liquid water. That's far from true. Billions of years ago, Mars had liquid water. Billions of years ago, Venus likely had liquid water. Maybe some liquid water survives on Mars. It look, it's looking iffy, but it could be maybe. So maybe life did generate on Mars and has somehow clung on all these billions of years. We don't know. When we look in the outer solar system, though, we get a huge surprise. When we look at these icy moons around the giant planets, we find huge globe-spanning liquid water oceans. Europa, the second moon of Jupiter, encrusted in ice. Underneath 100 miles of ice is a globe-spanning ocean with more liquid water than the Earth has. And it's not alone. Callisto might have it. Ganymede, Enceladus, Pluto, Titan. All of these worlds might have liquid water oceans underneath their crusts. Each one with more liquid water than the Earth. Where there's liquid water, there's the potential for life. No, they don't have access to the sun because, you know, super thick ice. But hey, life finds a way, right? And you bet it will make itself detectable. We're designing missions right now, like the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer, like the Europa Clipper, to study these moons in more detail, to hunt for signs of life. They'll make themselves known. Are we alone in the universe? We don't know. We just don't know. We don't know if we're, we, are, we truly are one of a kind, or if the universe is flooded with life. We don't know if we're the only intelligent civilization operating now or ever. We don't know. We don't know. That is the fundamental uh, uh, issue, the anger, frustration with the Fermi paradox is there should be life. It should be easy to spot, and yet we can't find any. SETI has not been successful. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence has not been successful. Is it time to hang up SETI? Maybe, maybe not. It's an interesting debate, isn't it? That maybe we should be done. It was worth a shot. Turns out 
either there's nobody home or it's way harder to get radio emissions out throughout the galaxy than we thought. One of those or both of those must be true. It could be that there are thousands of intelligent species in the Milky Way, but man, space is big and time is big too. And even though there may be life out there that we're just, it's essentially undetectable and we'll never know. But non-intelligent life is a better bet because we know what the signal looks like for non-intelligent life. For intelligent life, intelligent creatures are capable of doing anything. So you're never exactly sure what you're looking for. But non-intelligent life is constrained. It has to obey physics and chemistry and biology. So there are rules here. It's easier to make predictions. If you do photosynthesis, boom, you generate oxygen. And given enough time, you're probably going to oxygenate your entire atmosphere. It's just going to happen. So you're constrained. So you know what you're looking for. Maybe searching for non-intelligent life is the better bet. Yes, it doesn't broadcast, announce, or build megastructures, but it's simply there and exists and we can spot it. We're good at spotting things in astronomy. So maybe we shouldn't have a search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Maybe we should have a search for extraterrestrial life, S-E-T-L. Maybe we should give up SETI and we should just settle. Yes, this entire episode was designed so I can end with that joke. Thank you so much for watching. Please visit patreon.com slash pmsutter to learn how you can support the show. I really do appreciate it, and I'll see you next time.